Good morning, Meta Church. My name is Maggie. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I hope your Sunday is off to an amazing start. Um, this morning, we have a little odd request to ask. Um, go ahead and take your phone out. I know that's weird because normally you're told to put your phone away during church, but you heard me right. Go ahead, take your phone out and scroll through your contacts and click on the name of someone you love or someone who just means a lot to you in your life, whether a coworker or a friend or a family member, um, just someone who means a lot to you and go ahead and send them an encouraging text, whether it just be, hey, I hope you're having a wonderful day, you were on my mind this morning, or it can be something as simple as just, you matter to me. Whatever it might be, go ahead and send them that message. Um, for me personally, words of affirmation is my love language, so when someone sends me a text like this, it just hits different, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> So, but whether, even if words of affirmation isn't your love language, it still just feels so good to be reminded that you matter and that someone thinks you're special and that your role, the role that you play in their life is meaningful. So go ahead and do that and remind someone of that this morning. Um, this is just a powerful way to remember that we need to send uh, messages like this to each other often um, because words are powerful. So go ahead and just do that this morning. And um, since you already have your phone out, if you are new here or if you have a prayer request that you would like to share with us, um, you can do so by clicking the link in the video description below and filling out a connection card. This is just a great way for us to get to know you better and um, to be, be praying for you this week for whatever is on your heart or your mind. Um, so go ahead and do that as well. Uh, this is also a place where you can give to Meta if you would like to do that this morning or if you would like to sign up for House Church next week. Um, so this morning, Ricky's message is all about the spiritual practice and discipline of worship. Um, so like last week, we're going to be doing worship at the end of the message. So make sure you stick around for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to pray for us and then pass it over to Ricky. Dear Lord, thank you so much for giving us another opportunity to just come together and learn about you and seek you and um, become more like you. Uh, God, I pray for Ricky's words this morning about worship. God, I know that uh, worship is such a beautiful, powerful way for us to grow closer to you, whether through song or dance or art or poetry or whatever it may be. God, I just pray that this morning something in Ricky's message would just resonate with each of us and um, just remind us of how uh, powerful it can be when we come to you in worship, uh, whether by ourselves or alone. God, I just pray that uh, we would be able to remember each day um, just how wonderful it can be when we do worship you in a meaningful way. And um, God, we love you and we praise you. And it's in your name that I pray all of these things. Amen. Thanks, Maggie. I appreciate that. Uh, and I, it's kind of funny, like Maggie's recorded this somewhere else. I'm recording it in my apartment. Last week, Chris recorded a handoff to me. It kind of feels like I'm in like a newscast room. We're like, hey, back to you in the studio, Maggie. You're back to you in the studio, Ricky. So uh, anyway, um, we're going to jump into it here in just a second, but I got to let you know there is some kind of weird, crazy construction happening. My building is the slowest renovation in the history of humanity. Uh, and so if there happens to be any banging or drilling over the course of uh, this, I ask for your apologies. But I'm going to keep on going. So uh, we pray in Jesus' name that there are no distractions and uh, limited issues. So um, with that said, uh, we will get started and jump right into it. And so uh, I don't know about you. I don't know about um, what you think of last week. And this week we started kind of with worship uh, or without worship, I should say. We went from the welcome into the introduction. And if you grew up in church culture, then uh, maybe it feels a little bit weird. It feels a little bit odd to you because you're used to, we, I'm used to, uh, where we have our, you know, Sunday service. I mean, sounds kind of funny, but it's pretty predictable, right? Like you come in, there's a loud, like upbeat song, you know, and then the next song, and then usually there's a couple songs up front, and then someone comes in, hey, everyone, welcome to church, and they greet you, tell you, give you some instructions on what to do, and then, you know, you go into one or two songs, and they kind of mellow out or a little bit slower and more emotional, kind of draw you in and prepare you for the message. The pastor comes in, drops, uh, you know, a word, delivers a word that changes your life, and then everything on Sunday service is great. That's typical Sunday setup. That's typical Sunday church routine or, or, or maybe uh, church service. Um, but these past two weeks, we've, we've flipped it, right? We've gone from the introduction at the very beginning 
uh, then right into the message. And then today we're doing the same thing where we're having worship at the end following the message. And I know it's different, um, but I kind of like it being different. I like it because, you know, although in that other format, it's kind of like we use worship as a means to prepare us for the message. It forces us to prepare a little bit differently. Like it's this time now the message is actually preparing us to worship and it's preparing our hearts to worship. And I don't know if it's a permanent fixture, but I, I certainly believe it's something that we'll uh, kind of use, uh, you know, repeatedly and that we'll kind of adapt and, uh, and, and take as our own to fit, you know, whatever our goal or our intention is with our service. So anyway, I'll talk more about that later on, but that's not really where I want to start my message. Where I want to start my message is by actually taking you back to your middle school and high school years. I know for some of you, you're like, Ricky, I've abandoned those years. I never want to think about them. I was a pimple-faced kid. I was, uh, you know, uh, a mess. I didn't have any friends. Whatever it is, I just, I don't want to go back. Why are you taking me back to middle school and high school years? Other years, you might be saying, hey, those are my glory years. I was on top of the world. I was, you know, king of the rock. I was, I was the man or I was the woman and whatever. And, and you're like, I- I'd love to go back to my middle school and high school years, but, but I'm not really going back for either of those reasons. Um, I, I just wanna kind of jog your memory a little bit and get you back into those middle school and high school years because I don't know about how it was in your situation, in your middle school or your high school, um, but in, in my experience and in, in, and in my schools, uh, there was this thing called clicks. And, and I'm guessing you probably didn't have those, right? Like I'm guessing there was no such thing as clicks in your schools wherever you attended school. Um, but in my schools, there were these cliques and there was kind of a, several of them. And so I, I kind of just thought about a few of them, you know, of course there were the jocks, right? Like the football players, baseball players, basketball players, all of like the nineties movies and, and early 2000s movie had them like wearing their uh, letterman jackets, but that was never really a thing in my school. Um, but you had the jocks, right? The football players, baseball players, basketball players, they all hung out together and they kind of were all a certain type of group or a certain type of people. And then you had kind of this other group that was like a skateboarder slash punk rock type kids. And so they had, you know, the, the skate gear, they had, you know, the um, Blink-182 type of you know, approach to life and uh, the music and, and, and that kind of thing. So that was kind of one, uh, you know, separate click. Uh, of course, you had the popular and the cool kids. I don't know what classified or what qualified those kids to be considered cool or popular or how they ever, or their credentials, like what made them cool. I don't really know, but you had the popular and the cool kids. Uh, you had the theater kids and the artsy kids, right, who were into sing and dance and, and performance. And, and so that was kind of, you know, they had in my high school, they had to kind of like their own little section of the hallway where they would hang out during lunch. And um, then I went to a school that had uh, what's called the International Baccalaureate Program, the, the IB program. And so we had a lot of smart kids. So you had kind of the smarter kids that, that was their own separate clique. Uh, then you had the, the bouncers or the floaters, which uh, were the kids who didn't really have one particular clique, but they kind of just bounced or they floated around different types of groups of friends. And, and actually that's kind of where I fell into. I was an athlete in high school and I, I played sports, but I was really more of a floater. I didn't really hang out or associate with the jocks as much as I was just kind of bouncing around these different pockets uh, and different friend groups. And then you had the kids who said, you know what, I'm better than this. I'm not going to uh, abide by these social constructs that you're creating or trying to impose on me. And so they didn't hang out in any of these groups. And then we, those of us who are a part of these social constructs, call them the loners. Like, oh, they're not, they don't have any friends or they don't, you know, fit, you know, one of these uh, kind of criteria or fit in one of these cliques. And so they're, they're loners. And yet really they were actually probably just smarter than the rest of us and not really, you know, interested in that. So uh, there's different types of cliques. There's probably a few more that I didn't mention, but what I'd love to know is what, what clique were you in? What, what clique did you belong to? And, and if you're at house church, uh, you can certainly take a couple seconds to share with your neighbors or talk like I was in this clique. Um, if you're watching online, I'd love to see in the chats, uh, you know, in the chat, let us know I was a part of this clique or I kind of, you know, associated with this group of people. But what clique were you a part of? Maybe for some of you, you were like all in, like I'm a part of this clique, I'm a part of this uh, group of, of girls or this group of guys. And, and so this was, you know, my life and my, you know, identity over the course of years. Maybe others of you, you, you probably didn't even realize you were a part of a clique. And then all of a sudden someone says, oh, you're a jock or, oh, you're a popular girl or, oh, you're, you're kind of like on the cheer team or, or, or the soccer group and, and whatever it was. And so you just kind of became a part of this and when someone kind of you know said that's what you were you just kind of threw yourself into it like you just got so into the next thing you know you're like you look back and you're like yeah that's what I was but I didn't start there 
it's not like, you know, um, that's what I intended to. It was just kind of this Darwinian's version of natural selection in middle school kind of moved me and, 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 and kind of shooed me into this, uh, this role or in, into this clique. And it's funny how in our adolescence, you know, we can become those things uh, and, and kind of find our identity in those things and actually let those things be at the center of, I said, like as I said, you know, middle school and high school, that's seven years. So it could be at the center of our lives for, for seven years. But it's not just our adolescence where this happens. This also takes place in adulthood. You know, adults, we, we do it. It just looks a little bit different, right? We, we get caught up in these things and we become these things that um, we kind of idolize or these things that we uh, view as significant at the center of our lives. And so they, you know, we, we have um, just, like I said, different categories. It could be something from fitness um, all the way to, to, to politics, right? Like we have some friends that live in Harlem and they have a neighbor that lives above them. She works out like three times uh, a day. Like no exaggeration. We didn't believe them. They're like, no, seriously, she works out like three times a day. She's running, she's exercising. She's, she's an attorney and she's doing all these things nonstop. Like she is full-fledged in fitness. And so you, know, you have that friend, right? That they're all about their fitness. And then as we saw this last year over the last 18 months, uh, there's certainly some people who are way into um, politics who are like consumed with uh, the, the political stuff. And listen, I, I had people on my Facebook who uh, would profess the name of Jesus, say they're Christians, call themselves Christians. I could post a Bible verse. I could post something Jesus said. I could post an encouraging clip from a message on a social media. They wouldn't give it a like. They wouldn't give it a comment. The moment I posted anything political, they're chiming in, paragraphs coming in. This is why you're wrong. This is why my perspective is different. This is why this is right. And it was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, clearly this is at the center of your life. Clearly this is at the center of your being. And, and, and whether it's fitness or politics, those are kind of, you know, over here off to the side. But then there's things that are actually a little bit more harmful or potentially dangerous, right? Of course, there's things like, you know, people who become workaholics, who like kind of throw themselves into their work or throw themselves into their career, into their jobs. And, and that's what they do. And that's who they are nonstop. They didn't intend to be, but all of a sudden it's consuming them and it's taking all of their time and all of their mental capacity and all of their emotional capacity. And, you know, there's even further things that go beyond that where people are consumed or, or caught up with greed and their wealth and, 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 and money and, and just kind of like, this is what I want. This is what I'm after. This is what my life needs to be about. I mean, the truth is, again, it doesn't matter if you're a kid or a teenager or an adult. Humans, us, you and I, we have this innate proclivity or, or really even an aptitude to become like the things that consume us. Doesn't matter if it was being a jock or a popular girl or, you know, an athlete or a smart kid or if it's about your fitness or if it's about politics or if it's about your work, we end up becoming like the things um, that, that consume us mentally and emotionally. And it doesn't matter if we want to or not, it's just the way it ends up being. In fact, uh, British theologian and bishop N.T. Wright says it this way. He wrote, you become like what you worship. It's a simple quote, but he says, you become like what you worship. Now, I happen to believe that every person has something or someone that they worship. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist. It doesn't matter if you're an agnostic. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, Buddhist, Hindu. I believe every person and every, uh, every person has something or someone at the center of their life that they worship. And according to N.T. Wright, you become what like you worship. When you say, well, Ricky, what do you mean? Like, you know, the fitness person, it's not like they have a shrine uh, in their apartment or in their house. And, well, actually, maybe they have some trophies. Actually, maybe they have some porches or something. Okay, okay, so maybe the fitness person isn't a good example. Um, but, you know, the person who, who, who is a workaholic, it's not like, you know, they've got like this temple that they're going to uh, and they're worshiping saying, work, you are my God. Work, you are my idol. Work, you're the thing that I live for. And, and you say, well, that's not really worship. They're not singing songs about their work. They're not singing songs, you know, about um, their, their money or, or whatever it is. And, and, and I would say, yeah, like for most people, that's probably true. But it comes back to the definition of worship. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines worship as this. It defines worship as something or uh, the ability to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. To regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. And I believe at the center of each person's life is something or someone that is regarded with greater uh, respect, with greater honor, or with greater devotion. For some people, it might be their kids, 
they esteem their kids and they, they kind of worship their kids. Look at what my kid did. Look at how good they are. Look at how great they are. Or let me sacrifice everything so that my child could have this thing. And, 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 and kids are at the center. Their kids get greater honor, respect, and devotion than anything else in their lives. For some people, it might be the acceptance or the approval of others. And so as long as I could get someone's approval, as long as I can find someone's acceptance, that's, what I, that's what's going to fuel me. That's what's going to drive me. That's what's going to kind of lead me forward. For some, it might be the perception of everything being put together, you know, whether that's on social media or whether that's on the projection of, of, of your work or your experience. Well, you know, I was in a conversation with a friend literally just last week, and we were talking about a mutual acquaintance that we have who is kind of just consumed with presenting himself as being better off than he actually is. Now, he's actually quite successful. He's actually done some pretty incredible things. But he always wants to kind of project or, or present that he's better off or, or, or doing more than he's actually done. Because that's what, you know, he wants to do. That's at the center of his life is success or, or approval or, or, or kind of, you know, again, in social media terms, the likes or the retweets. You know, there's some people who at the center of their lives, it might be their money. It might be their freedom. It, it, it might be themselves, it might be their spouse or, or they, the spouse they wish they had, or it might be their God. Now, I don't know what it is in your life, and, and I don't know um, what exactly is at the center of your life, what it is that, you would, uh, that would be identified as the thing that you worship, but here's what I do know. What we idolize in our hearts will always materialize in our flesh. What we idolize in our hearts will always materialize in our flesh. In other words, the things that we worship, the thing that's at the center of our life, the thing that our world kind of revolves around in our heart will always show itself to the world around us. It will show itself in our attitudes. It will show itself in our thoughts. It will show itself in our actions and in our connections with other people. Now, this could be a good thing or it very well could be a bad thing. It honestly just depends on what it is that you worship or what it is that you idolize. Now, if you worship or idolize your career, then you're always going to find yourself or feel like you have to do more. If you worship your money, then you're always going to feel consumed or worried about whether or not you have enough of it. If you worship your kids or your spouse or that fictitious spouse or you worship another person, then you find, you're going to find yourself feeling disappointed and let down repeatedly because they're just humans. They're just people. If you worship the approval of others and you live by their approval or you live by their likes, then you're going to die by their rejection and you're going to die by their disapproval. And if you worship yourself, then I'm guessing one of two things is true. You're always going to struggle with feeling like you're enough or you're going to have very few friends because people don't like to hang out with people who worship themselves. Maybe both of those things are true in your life. But my guess, my guess is that that's not what you want to be at the center of your life. My guess is that if you're listening, if you're watching, if you're joining us for House Church, uh, if you've been part of this series that we've been in the way of Jesus, that it's not that you want that thing or those things to be at the center of your life. It's not that you want to idolize your work. It's not that you want to idolize or worship your success. It's not that you want to worship the approval of others. It's not that you want to worship another person. My guess is that you actually want to worship God, that you want Jesus to be at the center of your worship. And I think that's good news because because the goal of a Christian, as we've talked about throughout the whole of this series, the goal of the Christian is to become like Christ. And if what N.T. Wright said is true, then it's important that we understand this, that you, you want to, um, if you become like what you worship, then worshiping God is essential to becoming like Christ, right? That's the goal of this series, to become like Christ. And if what N.T. Wright said is true, you become like what you worship, then that would mean worshiping God is essential to becoming like Christ. And this is why Paul would write with uh, such a deep sense of burden and urgency in his letter to the church at Rome, to the Christians at the church at Rome. He wrote this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Here's what he says. I, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, 
This is your true and proper worship. Notice his language. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters. I'm pressing, I'm asking, I'm basically begging and exhorting you to live this way because this is your proper worship. This is true worship and this is proper worship. And from this one verse, I kind of want to extract from you or from it uh, three different thoughts, three different components that are essential for true and proper worship, that are essential for the true worship or Christ-centered worship that you and I would desire in our lives. You know, we, we want to put God first. We want Jesus to be at the center of our lives. And if that's the case, then it's going to require these three things. And I'll kind of give them to you one at a time um, to, to help you see what Paul is writing here in this passage. The first, the first component is perspective. If you look back at Romans 12, 1, he says, um, therefore I urge you in view of God's mercy. When Paul writes in view of God's mercy, he's inviting us to shift our perspective. He says, in view of, can you see this? Can you see who God is? Can you see what God has done? Can you shift your perspective to understand this? You see, the foundation of worship is this simple truth. God is God and I am not. God is God and I am not. Worship begins with seeing who God is and admittedly and recognizing who I am not. You see, God is all powerful. I am not. God is always loving and gracious. And newsflash, I am not always loving and gracious. God is always good. And apart from God, I am not good on my own. You see, worship begins when we say, you know, this is who God is. This is what God has done. This is the being that God is. And I am not God. I can't figure this out. I can't carry the weight of the world. I can't solve the world's problems. I can't resolve these issues. I can't figure out my own problems, let alone someone else's problems. But that's who God is. And that's what God can do. And so when we worship, it's about recognizing and seeing who God is. It's about shifting our perspective and saying, you know what? This isn't about me. It's about taking our eyes off of ourself and ourselves and moving them onto the one who is God. To quote N.T. Wright again, he said this, when we begin to glimpse the reality of God, the natural reaction is to worship him. When we begin to glimpse, not even see a full picture, not even have a complete understanding, but just a glimpse of who God is, the natural reaction is to worship. Because we see he's worthy of that honor He's worthy of that devotion. He's worthy of that respect. And he was worthy of it at a greater level or a greater capacity than anything and everything else we could ever potentially or possibly seek to worship at the center of our lives. See, worship is about shifting our perspective from ourselves and onto him. And the moment that we don't do that, the moment that we cease to do that, the moment that we forget to do that, then we have stopped or we have ceased worshiping. When we no longer see God for who he is and we no longer understand God for what he's done and we no longer take account of who he's been, then we've missed the mark and we fail to worship God properly. So if you want to worship, then it starts with your perspective. But then there's a second component. And this second component is also found in Romans 12 verse 1 and it's about offering. It's offering. Again, Paul writes this. He says, I urge you to offer your bodies, right? He says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So he says there's something you've got to offer if it's going to be true and proper worship. Real worship requires that I give something. Now, it's not something that we like to think about. It's not something that we often give thought to. But real worship, God-centered, Christ-centered worship requires that I give something of myself, that I offer it to God. Again, God is worthy of honor. God is worthy of respect. God is worthy of that devotion. And when someone or something is worthy of that, we tend to offer something back to God. You know, to worship is to pay tribute. In so many ways, worship is really just that, is to, is to pay tribute to someone. And you haven't paid tribute to someone if, you haven't, if it hasn't cost you anything. And throughout the scriptures, we see a multitude of ways in which worship is fulfilled or worship is offered. And so what I want to do is kind of just run through a quick list of a handful of ones that I kind of just picked out. And this isn't exhaustive by any stretch. 
but certainly it serves as a basis to help us understand what it means to offer to God in worship, what it means to bring something to God in worship. And I'll start first and foremost with praise. Psalm 150 um, verses 1 through 6, that's the entire psalm, is a great example. It's a psalm of David, but he talks, I'm going to praise you. and he's gonna, I'm going to praise you with music. I'm going to praise you with the lyre. I'm going to praise you with the harp. I'm going to praise you with the trumpet. I'm going to praise you with my voice. And so David communicates that praise is a form of offering. It's offering to God. It's a form of worship. Now, of course, this is what we are familiar with, right? Or most familiar with when we think of the word worship. We think of Christian music. We think of Christian songs. We think of coming to church. We call it a worship service. And we come and we think about worshiping being um, music, uh, being related to singing in a band and, 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 and kind of those pieces uh, reflecting worship. And that would be correct, but if that's all it was, then it would be incomplete. And more importantly, if all it is, if all we think about when it comes to worship is that it's about singing songs and not actually offering our praise to God, then we're doing nothing more than Christian karaoke. Now, I remember years ago, I was a youth pastor, and um, we had this student ministry that was growing. And like literally, we would, we would keep track of this. 40% of our kids, we had over 100 kids in the student ministry. 40% of our kids came from church fam or unchurched uh, families, meaning that they or their family hadn't gone to a church service in over a year, minimum, right? So some of them never went to church. Some of them, it's been over a year, a couple years, whatever the case may be. And so we were really specific and intentional about trying to create spaces where unchurched kids would feel welcome and invited and feel like they could belong and be a part of this community. And so after one of our, um, you know, Wednesday night gatherings, uh, one of the kids, you know, kind of said to me, he was like, yeah, I was like, what do you think? And it was his first time. And he was like, you know, it was really cool. Like, you know, that like, uh, it was kind of like Christian karaoke. And I started to laugh because I was like, this kid is so unfamiliar with like church context that I guess I never thought of. I was so familiar. He was so unfamiliar with it that I never imagined being in his spot thinking like, I'm going to show up to a church. I don't know what they do there, but then they're singing songs. Like there's lyrics up on the screen. So they're singing. So like, it is kind of like Christian karaoke. And the truth is that's all our words are if we're not offering real and sincere and genuine praise to God. Yes, music can be worship, but really it's the spirit and the posture of praise singing those songs you know, playing that music that actually makes it worshipful, not just because the church instructed us to stand and sing at this time. So praise is one of them. Confession, you know, Joshua 7, 19, the scripture I used last week, you know, Joshua said to Achan, give glory to God by coming clean, by making your confession, do not conceal it. And that was a form of worship. In fact, the English Standard Version says, give God your worship by making forth your confession. And so when we confess to God, that's a form of worship, saying, God, you're God. Again, that perspective, I'm not. I messed it up. This offended you. This is sinning against you. This is doing wrong. And so I'm confessing these things before you. That is a form of worship. Of course, there's service. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Paul writes and he talks about giving your service to God. He says, when you work, do it wholeheartedly, not for a boss, not for a person, but do it as you're doing it unto the Lord. When you do good works, when you do your job, that's because you're doing it unto God. That is a worshipful duty when you serve others, and when you treat your work, your employment, as service. Listen, I don't have time for this today, but this is probably ought to be another series or another sermon. Um, but man, if Christians could just treat their work, like the job that you get paid, I know you get paid for it, but if you could treat your boss and your coworkers and the people who report to you with respect, with dignity, with honor, not because they're worthy of it, but because you say, you know what, I'm treating this person the way I would treat my God. Man, if you did that, if you would treat it that way, the world would be like, listen, I need to go, I need to figure out who this God is. Why is that person so honoring and so reverent toward me and, and so gracious toward me? It's because that's who God is. So when we serve, whether it's at church, whether it's in the neighborhood, whether it's at our place of employment, that is a form of worship. That's a form of offering something to God. Of course, there's money. Right? When, when you give money, when we, that's what we say at Meta Church, when you hold nothing back, when you tithe, when you give, that is a part of offering. That is a part of worship. And you say, God, I'm giving this to you because you are worthy of this. I'm paying tribute to you. To use that phrase that I expressed earlier in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 9, uh, is a great testimony of this. When King David, um, all throughout 1 Chronicles 29, they're gathering the resources to, to prepare to, to build a temple to worship God. And the leaders of Israel and the leaders of Judah and, and, and the people come and they bring everything. And it says, and they worship God by giving their resources, their financial resources to God. That was a form of worship. That was a form of offering. And of course, you can offer your life 
as Jesus himself did, and he talked about in John chapter 10, 18. He says, no one's taking my life from me. I'm offering my life as a sacrifice, as an act of worship and obedience to God my Father. These are offerings. These are just examples of offerings, of things that we offer to God to provide true and proper worship, as Paul described in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And when you offer these things in a pure spirit, as I said, when you offer these things in a, in a, in a spirit of, saying of, hum, of humility and saying, God, you are God, again, the perspective, and so I'm bringing you this, then it becomes worship. You know, you can give money, but if you don't have the right attitude, if you don't have the right posture, listen, I'm not telling you you shouldn't do it, but I am telling you that's not real worship. Real worship is about the spirit and the heart and the posture behind it. So first component is perspective. The second component is offering. And then the third component is what I'm going to call authenticity. Authenticity. You know, again, going back to Romans 12, verse 1, Paul writes, he says, Now offer, your, um, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is something that is ongoing. Yes, living in the sense of breathing, right? Like I have breath. I woke up this morning. I can blink on command. Like I'm alive. But what Paul, the word he uses here is describing something that is ongoing, kind of repeated, not just kind of a one-off instance. It doesn't cease and it certainly doesn't end just because the music portion of the Sunday service has finished. Listen, again, I don't need to belabor this, but if worship ceases or if worship stops in your life when the band stops playing or when the worship song turns off the radio, then you are not worshiping. If our worship is about singing songs on a Sunday or listening to Christian music during the week, then we're living our lives, quite honestly, as hypocrites. And, and, and that's not my word. That's Jesus' word. In fact, this is what Jesus himself said in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. He says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Jesus said this. Listen, if your worship is this, if it's hollow, if it's not real, if it's not ongoing, if it's not perpetual, if it's not a lifestyle, then it's hypocritical. It's a farce. It's fake. It's not real. And this begs the question, are you, am I, worshiping in every season and in every circumstance of life? Does your worship, again, the perspective, the offering, the authenticity, does it go beyond the 75 minutes or the one hour that you gather for church? Does it go beyond the, the newest playlist um, that's you know, on Spotify or, or Apple Music? Does it go beyond those extent? Does, is it actually something that's real, that's living, that's alive, that's moving and growing and adapting, and in every circumstance, whether things are good or things are bad. Listen, you know why you can worship when things are bad? Like, I think about last year and how difficult and how emotional and, 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 and really just kind of um, devastating it was in so many ways for our family. Yet I found myself continuing to worship. And sometimes it had nothing to do with music. Many times it had nothing to do with music because I didn't find the lyrics to be substantive in that moment for where I was at emotionally or where I was at spiritually. But I continued to worship because I said, God, I know you're good. God, I know you're God. God, I know that my circumstances are trash. I know that my pain is real. I know that my hurts and my anguish and what I'm experiencing and the suffering is trying, it's difficult, and I feel like I don't know if I'm going to overcome or work through it or get through it. But God, you are God and you are worthy of my worship because I'm not God. And so I'm going to offer what I have, broken pieces, all of it together. I'm just going to bring it to you and say, God, this is yours. And that's what I did. That's real worship. And, you know, when I think about those middle school days that I mentioned earlier, in those high school days, you know, one of the worst things that could happen, at least in that time, as a 15-year-old kid, 14-year-old kid, one of the worst things that could happen is that someone would out you and call you, see if you remember this word, a poser. A poser. In other words, they would say, hey, you're not a jock. Hey, you're not a cool kid. Hey, you're not a smart kid. Hey, you're not a theater kid. 
hey, you're not a popular kid. Hey, you're not like, you know, on the cheer team. Hey, you're not like, you know, one of these um, that fit within this group. You're a poser. You're not a skateboarder. You're a fake. A poser is someone who pretends to be something they are not so that they could find acceptance and wholeness within the group. That was like the most offensive or the worst thing that could be said about you in middle school or high school was that you were a poser. But you know what? I think there's a lot of Christian posers. Because listen, you can listen to all of the Hillsong music you want. You can listen to all of the Elevation worship music you want. You can listen to all the Maverick City music you want. You can listen to all of that. But if you're not living your life in worship around the clock, 24-7, beyond the lyrics of a song, then you are doing nothing more than faking to be a person of worship or a worshiper of God when in reality you're just posing as something. And real worship is lived around the clock in the highs and the lows, with music, without music. It's about saying my life is a living sacrifice. That's what authenticity means. And my encouragement, my exhortation to you would be don't be a poser. Don't do it. You don't want to be known as that. I don't want to be known as that. I don't want our church to be known as that as people who show up on a Sunday or show up on whenever our services are and we sing some songs, we raise our hands in the air and we say, oh God, you're amazing. But then as soon as trials hit, we're not worshiping. As soon as problems come up, we've stopped worshiping God. As soon as we get to Monday and our work week starts, uh, so, you know, whatever, that was kind of my Sunday thing. That's not really what I do, you know, Monday through Saturday. I don't want that for us. I don't want that for you. So don't be a poser. So here's what I'm doing. I'm gonna give you three next steps, one for each of these perspe- or one for each of these points, one for each of these components, to help you worship with sincerity, to help you worship authentically, and to not be a poser. So here's next step number one about perspective. I want you to focus on one attribute of God each day this week. One attribute of God each day. So this is about shifting your perspective. So every day. Think about a characteristic or an attribute of God. It could be the same characteristic or attribute all week long. That's fine. Or you could say there's seven days in the week. I want to think about one different characteristic or one different aspect or attribute of God every single day. However you want to do it, but every single day, make a concerted effort to shift your perspective. Again, as Paul wrote, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's love, in view of God's grace, in view of God's forgiveness, in view of God's justice, in view of God's um, you know, power, in view of God's sacrifice. Shift your perspective by focusing on one attribute of God each day this week. Next step number two, about offering. Give to God anything that you are holding on to. That's it. Give to God anything that you are holding on to. It could be your time. You might say, oh, I, don't, I don't want to help someone because I'm too busy. I don't want to make a difference in someone's life because I got too much going on in mine. It might be uh, your money. It might be that uh, you've been holding on to it and you're saying, you know what, like, actually, no, I need to release this. God's saying, hey, this is how you worship me. You can sing the songs if you want, but if you really want to worship me, it's time to release your finances. It might be your kids. And, 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 and here's what I mean. I'm not saying, like, bring them to an altar. I'm not doing any sacrifices. <laughs> I'm not doing any child sacrifices. But what I mean is saying, God, these are your kids. You love them more than I ever could. My family, I love dearly, but you love them way more than I could. So God, I'm going to trust them to you. I'm going to entrust them to you. I'm going to offer them and say, God, you have your way in their life. I pray your will over mine for my kids, for my son, for my daughter, for my husband, for my wife, for my boyfriend, for my girlfriend, for my mom, for my dad. I pray, Lord, that you would have your will and your way in their lives. And I'm trusting that over to you. Offer to God, give to God anything that you are holding on to. And then the third next step on authenticity is simply a question. Answer this question, is my life reflecting true worship? Is my life reflecting true worship? This is a tough question. I can't answer that for you. Only you can. I can answer for myself, and I can tell you at times I've had to answer no, and at times I've had to say, God, no, I'm not living in true worship to you. And I've had to repent of that, and I've had to change, and I've had to turn back to God. And if that's the answer in your case, then it's as simple as repenting and turning back and saying, God, I'm not living in true worship, but I want to, and I choose to, and I will. 
and I'll be authentic as a living sacrifice. So these are the three next steps for this week. And so as we wrap up today, we're actually going to respond with music as a form of worship, as a form of offering, as a form of giving God our praise. And the first song we're going to sing is a song uh, called Living Sacrifice. Uh, we maybe sang this or played this, you know, several months back. It's been a while. But it's all based off of this verse, Romans 12, 1. And I think it's a perfect response to us uh, to sing, um, to, to praise God and say, God, this is my commitment to you. I'm giving my life to you. And then the second song is a, called, uh, is a song called Sinking Deep. And again, it's all about reflecting on who God is uh, and, and what he's done and being caught up in his presence. And so I'm going to pray for us and then we'll stand and sing these songs. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this word. We thank you, God, for worship. We thank you, God, that through our worship, we become like Christ. That is specifically through our worship of you, we become like Christ. I pray for each and every person uh, that we would, um, you know, uh, just throw ourselves into worship in every way, God. Not just music, not just songs, not just lyrics, but in every way that you lead us, that we would worship you fully and wholeheartedly. May we be changed because of it or by it, and may we be better because of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks so much for joining us today and thank you for worshiping with us. Just one quick note, next Sunday is July 4th, Independence Day, uh, and we will not be having any sort of meta services, gatherings, there's no house church, there's no sermon online or anything like that. Uh, enjoy the holiday weekend. I know a lot of you already have plans to be out of town or to be with family or friends. Um, so just enjoy the holiday weekend and celebrate, be safe, uh, of course, and, and don't go crazy. Don't blow off any fingers or hands or anything like that. And don't let your loved ones do that either. Um, but we'll be back on Sunday, July 11th, uh, regathering as house church, of course, service online. Um, but let's practice, put, you know, or let's put this into practice and be true worshipers of God. Have a great week and we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks.